So this is what ICGB neutral layer building looks like in the monsoon season on the top. And we started that our life actually revolves around this four bases. So that's where we are working in a small set of uh, chemic, chemical compounds and how they have been recognized. And most of the work has been generously funded by ICGB core fund and Department of Biotechnology Government of India. And there's some things we also receive for Department of Science and Technology. And we have a good collaboration or agreement with ESRF, Synchrotron. And of course, Electra we also have, but we have not measured any data, collected data at Electra. But we have collected majority of data at ESRF, uh, which I will also talk in. So, I have put a talk title General Nuclear Catalog. Of course, our life uh, work started with the RNA. And this interaction actually starts since the time the single standard RNA is born from the transcription edit. And among all the functions, it still it dies down translation. Everywhere you see the protein RNA interaction or protein nucleic acid interaction in general. So we started actually now the three questions we are trying to address, although it looks quite simple in a way, that how the protein rapidly scan and search for the cognitive targets inside an extensive area where the lots of molecules of protein now with this nucleic acids are there inside a cell or if you are looking for DNA inside a nucleus. So they, how they rapidly do because this works have to be done very rapidly and specifically how do the RNA binding protein discriminate between when it comes single stranded or how discriminate between DNA and RNA. And this becomes important because most of the recognition in the single stranded are through the bases. And bases, if you look at the stacking interaction mostly, and there's hardly any difference between U and T except for one methyl group. So the stacking interactions would be mostly common. And in spite of that, the interactions are very specific. And how do we actually then discriminate is one question. And the final question is that they put what is the code for single standard nucleotides? The cognition, when you have the four bases and the three aromatics residues, and a, a combination of that only makes the cognition more part. And in that process, it's really specifically binds to things and they discriminate other sequences, how it happens, whether there can be a code or not. So a few years back, I think, roughly 10, 15 years back, there was an article written by Sir Allen, single standard nucleic acid recognition is their code after all. So that was a question posed some years back. And we do also believe that God doesn't play pass. So we do think there must be a code. It cannot be completely random. And that actually motivated us to work in this area. So among this, we started with RNA, of course, single standard when it comes the first thing comes in the RNA. And RNA binding protein, there are plenty of RNA binding protein. Motifs are there. And most of the things which are defined as either the SRBD domain, endonucleus domain, KH domain, PAD domain. So all different domains have been classified that sense. And most of the times what you see here, actually there are modular. So one domain is repeated many times. And probably nature has designed in a manner that it has a better affinity for the recognition. So we started working on a one small, most predominant one, which is called RRM domain, the RNA recognition motif. And it's like others, these are also modular. And some of the protein which are listed, they have either four, four, two, and some have only one. So this also makes it interesting that even one can have a enough affinity to that that. So this motif is uh, one of the most abundant one. It's also known as the RNA binding domain. About 2% of human proteome contain this RNA domain. So that's its why. And most of them, which have been characterized till date, they are involved in post transcription process. It's a very small. These domains are very, motifs are very small. They are roughly 90 to 100 residues. And among that, there are two key regions, what we call ribonuclear protein domain, RNP regions. So they are RNP1 and RNP2. So each RNP has two RNPs. And among that, the key things are these four aromatic residues, which are well conserved. So either it is phenylalanine or tyrosine. In very few cases, they are not there. And in rare of the cases, they are replaced by peptides. 
but most of the time they are quite well conserved. They have a very well conserved topology. And what you see here is the same alpha. So there are four beta strands on the front. So they form a nice sheet. And on the back side, there are two helices. So the helices are at this juncture known to give a supportive structure role. Not much function has been scribed for this helices. Why? Because and these aromatic residues are hanging around on this beta strand. So they are protruding outside, and that's where this interaction happens. <clears throat> so this interaction with the bases are either through the T stacking, which is the stronger one, or Sorry, because. Or it's a parallel stacking which happens here. So which are these are the parallel stacking are a little weaker one compared to the P stacking, but most of the time these kind of interactions are actually seen in this protein. Two years back about in fact long back, when they try to classify the energies between if they have a combination of different bases and a different combination of aromatic residues, what kind of energies will be there? And these energies are roughly in about 10 kilocalories per mole. So these are weak. And why weak? If you look at the other interactions, if there are Coulombic interactions or if you have the hydrogen bonding, that's quite strong. Of course, Coulombic are once the strong because the phosphates are involved and the positive side chains are involved. Hydrogen bonding are also involved, strong ones, but the stacking base is up here 10 to 50. So they're quite weak. So that leaves a big question why there are weak interactions happening there and what is important. Probably nature has kept this weak interaction just to help the uh, system so that it can bind and also can be easily broken by if it is required. So we are here we are talking about quite a big interaction of among that. We also try to look at the in the protein data bank how they are actually happening. So if you have different four bases right, and the, they have mostly are seen with filan and anine. In very rare cases, tryptophans are there. And in some cases, tyrosines are there. So this is what the structure shows that they are partnering with the aromatic crystal, predominantly with the phenylalanine, and which is kind of speculative and the reason that phenylalanines are the better aromatic ones, and tyrosines, because of the hydroxyl group, it may have a weaker uh, stack. So, so then we asked how they are actually present in the RSS RLMs. At different position where they should bind second, third, and all this position we see it's a predominantly phenyl ring. Rarely it's a other tryptophan, and sometimes they are missing ones, which is almost similar to if they are replaced by tyrosine. And this is what is in the RRN domains. <clears throat> so on that line, we started working with different of the proteins, looking at different sequences, if we're thinking whether they can have a different modalities of interactions and you saw different structures. I'm going to talk a few of them here and why they are actually different as also we discuss. I'm not going to talk about this here. This also a unique structural motif which we discovered. The first time we saw that RLN by having a dimer structure and strand exchange mechanism where the both strand is formed from the other domain, other partner. So two monomers are coming together and forming a complete RLM thing. So that's what you see here coming here. And from the other monomer, it's forming. So this is the first time we observe that it is a dimer. Since ICGP New Delhi is a predominantly Malaya research group, so and this one protein, the SR, this protein they have for working, the polymer group was working for a long time. And then I asked my student actually, they were interested in Akshay and Garima. They started working on this. So this protein in malaria biocide, the plasmodium falciparum, has two RLM techniques and motif. And in C terminal end, there is a largely unstructured SR region, which gets phosphorylated and it has different functions, but largely unstructured. 
and this was the first protein to be characterized in any epic complex. And it is involved in alternate splicing through recognition of exonic splicing enhancer ESC1, which are in virus. But again, since Malaysia has been worked long, so there were plenty of literature what RRM, this RRM is binding to which RRM. So we synthesized different RRM and finally we shortlisted what is the minimal motif required for RRM interaction. And this we did through isothermal titration and calorimetry. We also characterized the individual binding contribution to individual residues. And this we can do by NMR that how much each residue is contributing to affinity of this RNA by partner. And this is individual contribution we also characterize. We use the conventional NMR spectroscopy because this protein was, well, of course, we tried to crystallize, but this was not crystallizable. So we solved it by pollution NMR spectroscopy. And nothing new as far the structure is concerned. It's the same canonical fold we got, four beta span and two helices at the back. And it's a nice uh, charge distribution with should facilitate the nucleic acid RNA recognition. We also solved the protein RNA in complex structure by NMR spectroscopy, and which was sitting in this RNA, finally, this we see, the RNA was sitting nicely in this group where it comes and binds. So it's like you see the interactions are there. And what we see actually, the three key bases, are C, A, and U, are contributing largely to the affinity. The rest are the supporting ones. So if you change any of this one, the binding is quite weakened, and many times it doesn't exist at all. So finally, we came out and we did a lot of mutational studies to confirm that. But as far as the recognition is concerned, there are nothing exciting as such. Of course, the biology part, plasmodium biology has many other sensors to make, which I've not discussed with this subject. And it also had this nice P stacking, which provided enough affinity to the interaction. So then, this, then we thought of looking some other protein. And then we looked at one protein, TAC15. This again, Akshay and Kashyap worked on that when, by pursuing their PhD. And this protein, while we selected, we saw that unlike other protein, it had only one RRM. So we were worried that actually how one RRM can provide enough affinity for the RNA recognition. For that, we know the binding energy are something like 10 to 15 kilocalories per mole. Other interesting part was that at the end terminal, it has a QGSI rich repeat region, which is largely unstructured, almost unstructured. Then it has again RGG repeat, which is unstructured. After that, it has a zinc finger domain. And after zinc finger domain, it again has a RGG. So apart from zinc finger and RRM, the protein is largely unstructured. And so this is involved in also earlier what the biology said, it is involved in pre-RNA, mRNA splicing, and it is also mutations have been implicated in FLS disease. So if you have seen those mutations, then it raises to the problem with FLS. It has a, this protein has a four member in its family, the TAF, FUS, EFS, and of course, this is aligned with the same thing in Drosophila also have. So this is largely conserved here. And what is interesting here is that it has mm -hmm. not many aromatics. And I'll show you in the later slide, we'll appreciate that. So we made several different construct of this protein. Since it is clear that N terminal domain and the C terminal unstructured domain will not play any role in binding to RNA, we just cut out simply all of them. We have first thing, which only RRM, this green one, has one construct. And second construct, we made RRM plus RGG plus zinc finger. So these two constructs we made. And the longer construct, we started calling RMDT. So the thing was first to see that this, to look at this, whether this zinc finger and RRM are interacting to each other or not whether they could come close in together and form a recognition domain. So for that, we use this NMR dynamics. So higher the bar in this NMR dynamics, the, pro the residues are considered to be quite rigid. Lower the bar means they are unstructured in this case. So if you look at the RRM only construct, almost all are the same height, same length. So the, all the residues are largely well structured. 
For the other one, we see a nice dip in the RGG region. And as predicted, this is unstructured. The zinc finger is again rigid. So what it implies that there is a linker in between two domains, and both the domains are independently tumbling in the solution. So they are not interacting with each other. And this means that recognition part could be only one domain may be involved because they are not coming together in this case. Then using, say, again, conventional animal spectroscopy, we solve the structure. And that's what we see here. Unlike four aromatics, it has only two aromatics on this thing. So that made our life a little bit again interesting that only two aromatics cannot provide enough affinity for the interaction to happen. So there cannot be enough binding energies for that. But there must be some other residue involved or some completely different mechanism. Other fascinating thing was in that, unlike other RRM domains, it has another alpha 1 beta 2 loop. There is an additional loop here. The rest of everything is conserved, but there is an additional loop compared to all other RRMs. And among the family member, this alpha 1 beta 2 loop is conserved. So this family has this conserved loop. And nature will not obviously keep something which is doesn't have any usefulness. So there must be something usefulness to alpha 1. And so we got more interested in that, that it must have something to do with this alpha 1 beta 2 loop. So at this juncture, we started looking more into literature. And literature was full of the questions. There are many different kinds of reports were there, like which domain is responsible to RNA binding. There were many reports, like some reports were there, only RRM is there. Some said that RRM plus RGG. There were reports RRM plus RGG plus thin finger. What is the recognition sequence? There are many signals that published. Some are saying that GGUG is binding, CUG repeats are binding, but there are only one report was published that said it's not a linear RNA which is binding, it's a structural RNA which is binding to the protein, so a stem loop RNA. And there was no consensus. Of course, then there were no biophysical or structural studies, biochemical studies, and what some of them were there with lots of shortcomings. So it put us on a very difficult task. So whatever was published in the literature, we synthesize all these RNA. And that was a costly affair. Those who are working in RNA will know this is a costly affair, actually. So we synthesize all this RNA, different domains, 6 mer, 25 mer, 10 mer, whatever were published, we synthesized. And we did ITC. And finally, what we saw that that a stem loop RNA was binding with the RRM plus the longer one, almost the same affinity. So RRM is also binding with the same affinity, and the cluster, which had RGG and link finger, also had the same affinity. So this gave an idea that only RRM could be involved in RNA binding. And we also saw from the data that link finger is tumbling independently. And same was also seen for the first one, whether it is bind, was binding to stem loop RNA. Using that NMR spectroscopy, we decided to see which are the residues getting involved in interaction. So the residues which are showing large perturbation are the higher ones, which are binding, showing by interaction. So these are the residues which are largely perturbed upon stem loop RNA binding, and they could be possibly involved in RNA, RNA interaction. We looked for the longer construct, and we saw the same residue getting perturbed, but other residues are largely unperturbed. So all these three results, the dynamics data, the ITC data, and NMR data, clearly and unambiguously suggested that it's only RLM which is involved in RNA interaction. The RGG and zinc finger are not at all involved in the interaction. And that made our life a bit easier, that we can work with the small RLM, not working with the larger construct. And finally, we solve the structure of that. And we do see a nice binding that the stem loop is binding to the protein in a very non-canonical manner, which was not earlier described, that where the loop is seen to interact with the protein, the stem hanging around. And what you see here nicely that the alpha 1 beta loop and other loop, they are forming a nice surface for the loop to bind. So it is a concave surface 
and the loops convex surface both are binding to each other and they are providing a nice geometry for the interaction to happen and it's something like an analog to a ball or holding a ball with the same convex and concave interaction and of course these are supported by a variety of hydrogen bonds so stacking was not at all important in that so that's what since it was a completely new interaction we hurriedly published a little bit half cooked data i could say at this juncture but we published that because it was a new mode of interaction was there later about i think few years later the Fredelin group also published with the first protein where they also showed the stem loop binding to the protein in addition but also they saw that linear rna can interact with a zinc finger certain extent so this protein does a dual role it binds to stem loop also and using the rgg and zinc finger it binds to independent single standard linear rna and possibly we we need to explore the function how and what it does actually binding after that the summary so far with these two proteins what we stand here the protein can have same canonical rm4 where the four strands are there and helix it can have completely different target and completely different mode of recognition so we can have just looking at the structure or the feature biomechanic features we can say that it can bind to same thing so just a small variation a missing two aromatic residue an extension of alpha 1 beta 2 loop can completely make the recognition different the third one is is also interesting and this is the the rna binding motif binding to dna and this whole lot of work was already described and this is first rn protein which was described that it can bind to dna single stranded dna so and this is the rbms1 protein this was isolated something like about 40 years back 30 years back and it is a, one of the family of meat chain single stranded binding protein and it's shown to control expression of proto oncogene gcmic in human cell what it does actually this rbms1 protein binds to the promoter region this starts with enhancer region bind to this region which is two kilo base upstream and controls is the expression of cmic gene and it also have, uh, controls the dna replication and apoptosis in order to enter the cmic gene which comes out which is also required for cellular growth and transformation with structure stall and what is interesting is that rvms protein also interact with cmic protein so it finds a nice cycle here where protein is controlling the expression of that as well as this is also binding to cmic protein and this also during the single function so we started looking on this part of that but how it is binding to this promoter region this protein again and this is specifically means here these few points are important for the students now because this has two rrn domains which has been by all studies biochemistry and biomedical analysis were described that rrn1 comes from 58 to 132 and 142 to 219 is second rrn2 and the rest is largely unstructured region which are still the function is not completely known this is said since all the literature was published with this in size 58 to 290 and made a construct which contain only two rrn domains and we recorded its nmr spectra because just looking at nmr spectra one can see about what kind of structure or what kind of uh, dynamics it has and we got something very weird spectra where the so well dispersed line but in the middle you see very broad lines broad lines signify a lot of conformational exchange going on there is no fixed conformation and they can uh, it's a flexible one if exchanges are going on and if you keep the protein for some time it used to form soluble aggregates so it was not amenable to the structural studies so this is a problem and we tried so many things when so much of our biochemistry putting dpt putting bme putting proline proline rgna I mean, whatever combination is available to be a structure biology we tried but we were not successful we every time we were stuck and priyanka was really getting frustrated for that because it was I means no way it's not no way leading to the phd because the protein itself is not stable in what we do 
And somewhat on one point in time, it actually C came with an idea that something is fishy about the bioinformatic analysis here. Means if you look at intuitively from the basic biochemistry, this boundary which is defined at 219 is something wrong. And so C added five more residues to this such subject. That's five residues. And of course, there is no software to do it. Is it is where no AI or ML can work. It is purely human intelligence has to come into the picture, the fundamental knowledge. And C added just these five residues. And we see a nice change in the spectra, all uniform line width. Everything is perfect. The protein was stable for 20 days, room temperature, nothing was happening. So what we suspected here, why we got this idea, this five residue at the end is making the beta seed complete. So if you have a two beta strand coming together, if they're not complete, it will have a large conformational dynamics because it's not able to have enough hydrogen bonding. And that will lead to the interstrand binding with other monomers, and that will allow the protein to aggregate. That is that was the problem. So, and that's why many times I give an example this to people that bioinformatics analysis as other structures are concerned, it gives a, it's a good tool, it gives an idea, but take the result with a pinch of salt because many times it may not be correct either. So finally, but we had a very good protein at the end, and we saw the structure. Also, it is quite more interesting. We again use the conventional NMR technique to solve it. We have the canonical domain, the four strands, four stand for the RM1, RM2. But what was interesting here that once we overlay one domain, the other domain is a little bit in the flexible in the hemisphere. When you overlay the other one, the first one in the is in the hemisphere. So it means the two domains are tumbling independently. They cannot be fixed to orientation. So they are independent. So this linker is providing a nice in here, which is making it to turn two domains independently. And that's why all our attempts to crystallize this protein fail. And now after solving this, we got an idea that, okay, this was the key problem that the protein was not crystallized. Because this is two domains are quite flexible with each other, related to each other. Another interesting part here, of course, charge description described here, that one RM has is three aromatics and other has only two aromatics. So it's a differential affinity is seen here. One will provide the higher affinity, and the second domain will provide the lower affinity. So the first one should take part in binding more efficiently, and a second will give a supporting role. This is an idea, something which we got at this juncture. To convince the referees of all this, our thing, we made again the two constructs separately, RRM1 and RRM2, and the call it the spectra. And we overlaid with the full one. Why we did? If the two domains are in, interacting with each other, then there will be changes in the environment of the residues which are interacting with each other, and they will show the peak shift. But they didn't show any peak shift here. The first argument was there that two domains are completely independent in the solution. They're not talking to each other at all. We look at the dynamics also, and in between we see in the middle that things are going down. So it is flexible. The linker is flexible. And we also perform a longer MD simulation where we see the two domains are really moving independently with each other. And this linker is providing a nice hint for this movement to happen. So this serum make promoter sequence is described as like this. So they can be changed in A and T here, but I'll give this, this one. So we again decided because it has to bind this small DNA piece, we decide different sequences and to see which has the best affinity. So we see inside the full long this promoter sequence, the shortcut ones coming down even to the four bases long DNA, and where the binding affinity almost goes down. To summarize this thing, but it's a small list of DNA sequence where we work with ITC, and we see affinity as long as going from the two point six or something like three 
four going up to something like 80 micromolar. And four is D, which is not binding at all. So we selected something which was the range which was exclusively the correct sequence of the promoter, which has almost same affinity as a longer one for the and as practice in our lab, we are given, in spite of failing to crystallize the free protein, we did try again to crystallize the complex. And this time, the comp we also, before that, we also looked that whether magnesium is involved in DNA binding. And we didn't see any role of magnesium binding with this protein. So magnesium was not playing any role. And from all this long data, what we see that where it can tolerate the mutation. So some mutation can be tolerated here, but this part, ATP, must be conserved for the interaction to happen. And this is long, from the long list of DNA sequences which we had worked. So this is, at this answer, we found that this sequence has to be there for that inner affinity. And once we tried to crystallize, this time, it was readily crystallizable. It crystallized the DNA sequence easily. There was no problem with that. But it has a very unusual pattern. So what was happening, the one protein, the RLM2 was interacting part of the DNA, and other one it has was binding with the so it, it was a very unusual crystal pattern, which we have seen. And if we talk to Ainos, what is happening in biology, this has to be further explained because they will say okay, it's a crystallized artifact or thing you are saying. So, but what was also good that we had a very nice definition of DNA in the complex. So it had a nice B factor and we could really construct the chain quite well. So the structure was not a problem. The structure point also, it was same again, the stacking interaction was happening and that's why we didn't see any role of magnesium in the binding because if the stacking is there, the metal ions are not going to play any much role. We also see that what are the residue getting involved in binding we see the loop are also getting strands are mostly involved. You see the nice strands are there, but some of the residue in the loop are also getting involved in binding in the RLM1 part. In RLM2, again, there are two residues in the linker, but mostly it's a strand residue which are getting involved. Of course, again, the stacking and few hydrogen bonding interest. So this structure doesn't have any artifact. We have to again go back and do the study in the solution. So confirm that same residue which we saw in unusual packing of crystallization are involving binding in solution. And then we use the NMR. So the residue which are shifting, we measure the distance and plot it, engage the residue, and we found the same residues are involved in interaction, what we have observed in crystal structure. So this is no crystallization artifact, but it was just an unusual packing we got in that. So it confirms that. To confirm that residues which are involved in linker and other places, we mutated those of them and we see a KD going really up. So it is not able to bind to the sequence. Of course, so in some places, if it is there, it could tolerate for the sequence. So coming to the now we superimpose the free structure and the bound structure. What we see here that there is a movement. There is a nice movement of the set. The hinge is providing the movement for the DNA binding. And the distance it covers something like 10 to 18 angstrom, it moves so that it is able to bind the DNA sequence. And that's why this flexible hinge region is important for the recognition to happen. And I'll come to later part also the white reasons required for the traction to happen. The NMR dynamics, again, we see the loop has become a structure, which is about going down here, it has become almost rigid here. We again perform the MD simulations to confirm the dynamic data. Now we don't see much movement. They are rigid after binding to DNA. So they are completely rigid. And this, and that was the reason that we could get the crystals easily, which were not getting for the free protein. Because now DNA is making the whole thing is something like a global entity for the DNA bound proteins. So summarize what is happening is that the protein response domain, which is coming, binding, providing enough affinity. The second domain, there's a movement here, and then comes and provides a supporting role. 
the first one actually scans, binds the correct region, and second one then orients further and binds to the other region, providing enough affinity for the interaction to happen. And I must really, this work was done greatly by this girl all alone, Priyanka. I and mean, she actually she designed the work. She worked hard to get it. And so, see, so this is the one first paper from the ICD in Delhi where PhD student is also a corresponding author. And it was my pleasure to see her this because she really put in hard work in this bit, solving the structure, which was remaining. And probably, I think, such an important protein because the structure was not solved. Probably, I think the main culprit was the not correct definition of the residue. I think many people must have tried this thing. We had a certain kind of luck, idea, innovative idea from her, or some kind of divine help, whatever it is. But we could get to finally to the structure of this complex. Second thing, there are three models have been suggested. How DNA rapidly search this correct sequence? One is the two domain, it's just simply slides on a DNA and finds the correct thing, binds it. This is one thing. And of course, it will be quite slow if there's a slide on a DNA sequence. Second is something like what Hydra does, hopping and diffusion, bind and then jump, bind and then jump, hopping and diffusion. And third, which is also postulated is intersegmental pass, where one binds and if second finds, it just other loops out and moves correctly there. So this process will be quite efficient and rapid out in that sense. So now in this protein, what would work? So this work is still in progress because we will need uh, cryo-EM setup for that because it will involve a lot of DNA and the protein. But nevertheless, we tried with whatever small setup then we have. We look at the RBMS protein here and we do see the looping outs. And of course, uh, poor quality of the picture, but analyzing, get a nice looping. And for DNA, it's largely longer one. So what we think in this protein, it is the intersegmental transfer happening for the rapidly binding to the correct DNA sequence. So that's what think here this intersegmental transfer, the correct one where it just binds. And that's why the one domain which has three aromatics, it searches very fast, provides a decent affinity. And if a decent affinity is weak, the second domain just orients and comes there and provide a good affinity for the interaction to happen. So with that, I thank uh, Dinkar because I took help of Dinkar, I'm not a crystallographer. I took his help because normal crystallography, we can do molecular placement or SAD or something. But this was very unusual packing. I needed his help. And we took help of Sam also in that, who is a crystallographer. Tenjin helped us with the cryium data. We collected uh, X-ray diffraction data for some of the protein at National Institute of Immunology, where we saw the faculty in charge. And Ravi, the technician there, helped us with collecting data. And thanks to you all.